All right, we are recording. All right. Well, uh, welcome to our um, welcome to the lecture about um, embedded program planning. So uh, this one should be fairly quick, um, but we do have a, a short slide deck, and then I'm sort of going to try to, I think, give examples of how it how it kind of shakes out and see how it goes with that. So I'll share my screen. Every program planning. Um, yeah, so I, this is the lecture outline is, it's, you know, I thought a lot about this lecture for a while, you know, what, what is there to really talk about without either, you know, getting too far afield of the main point. Uh, you know, you're not really talking about memory allocation or memory management or esoteric things like that. You know, what we're talking about is how do I go about planning a program in an embedded system? And so the, the introduction is sort of a how we are talking mostly about microcontrollers. I mean, not all embedded systems are microcontrollers, but that is what we're going to talk about here because they're uh, pretty ubiquitous and they're, um, I would say like, well, you know, they're really everywhere when you need something that's low power and uh, not terribly complicated. A microcontroller is one of the first things you'll grab. Um, and the, the real big difference between a microcontroller and some kind of general purpose computer or even like embedded embedded general purpose computers is it has to do with memory management and protection and that is that general purpose computers have a lot more of that and it's much more advanced whereas microcontrollers it's pretty um pretty loose with um with the way that, that they manage memory you know with with really small microcontroller applications you could be looking at doing static allocation for everything, but then you find yourself calling mallocate more and more often. And, and then when problems occur, it's, it's very difficult to debug, but, but you can go a long way with, um, with microcontrollers. Um, you can do a whole lot with them. And usually we, with microcontrollers, we refer to it as programming on bare metal. And that is to say there's no operating system. There's no sort of layer that's managing your interface to the memory. It's really just, uh, you know, the, the, pro the program executes your, your statement and you can write directly to various registers. And, and, you know, even if it's through a function call or something, it is going directly to, um, you know, it, the memory that you're trying to alter. Uh, rather than having some kind of memory management unit. Um, and then just as a thing to throw in there, you know, the difference between a single loop and multiple loops. Um, the simplest case is that you have a single loop of execution. Um, usually if you need more than one loop, you're looking at some kind of real time operating system. Um, so you may you may think it's you know it it is pretty simple and but you can go a long way with just a single loop microcontroller program um, as we will as we will see the I think the one thing to keep in mind with planning your program is to keep it simple. Um, I mean sometimes you can't avoid complexity, but um, as much as possible, simplicity is nice. Um, when you start, when you're trying to think about the behavior of your program, you want to start with a flow chart and a single loop. And as you plan, you may find you need perhaps a state machine, which is another block, um, as we will, as we will see. And I like this, I like this slide, so I included it. Um, here's, here's a sketch of like a basic C program uh, over on the right. Um, it's it is uh, 
very simple, you know, you just, but it has all the basics, parts that could be fleshed out and very large. But the bottom line is that the, um, what, where the action happens is your main loop. You know, that's where the program execution will begin. And that's what, and that's sort of just, um, it's, it's just it's more like a convention that the compiler looks for a function called main that returns a type of integer and uh, usually is of type integer. Uh, but it looks for that main function and it, and it directs the program execution to begin right at that block of memory. So all this other stuff that's happening above it, you know, these are like, you're sort of defining memory allocation and things like that. But until you get into the main loop, you know, things aren't really happening. Um, if you want to, you know, you can have things like things that the compiler will evaluate. You can have that up above the main function. But if you don't put your code in a main function, it's not going to get executed. Now you may say, what about interrupt? And those aren't in the main function, but they, but they sort of are. Because at some point in the main function, you have to register the callback to the, for, for the interrupt. But at some point in the main function, you have to set the necessary registers in order for that interrupt callback to get called. So it really is very uh, main function centric. Uh, even when you're working with an RTOS, you know, usually everything starts, well, everything does start at the, at the main function, unless you're, you're doing some really um, esoteric organizations of, of code. Um, but that's, that's a point I wanted to, to get across. But the first thing you do when you enter your main function is you set up um, set up necessary things, you know, setting up peripherals, setting up GPIO, whatever that might be. Then you'll enter your infinite loop where you can do many things. In this case, you can probably take a guess what this program is sketching out. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that to the reader to decode. Um, so then when you when sometimes you'll find that your the behavior of your program is very dependent on sort of the state of uh, of the system and you need different behavior in different states and there's a thing there's a thing called a state machine um, and looking at it it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense you know how to, how this would translate from this diagram on the right to um, to an actual program, but but we will look at sort of how that that would occur. Um, but state machines are just you know they're they're the I think it's best like an example is the best way to talk about state machines. Uh, but basically, a state machine is going to be like a block a block of execution in your, in your infinite loop. Um, so you can do other things outside of the state machine, but when you have that state dependent behavior, that's going to occur in your state machine. Um, do I have anything else? Yes, I do. I mean, not slides, but I have. Uh, so here's a, here's a flow chart I drew up uh, very quickly. You know, the, this is how you would draw a flowchart, and the flow, and it is what it, you know, it's a sequential kind of um, diagram where one thing follows after the other, whereas a state machine, you know, is like a flat diagram where it's not apparent how one thing follows from the other. Um, but what occurs, where this would be like the execution of our main function. You'd go straight into an infinite loop and then do these things. I have it toggling some LED, and then I have it running a state machine, um, of which I don't have diagrams here. You could diagram a state machine in your flowchart. Um, I'll show you. I think I have an example pulled up for that. And then you can have 
here's an example of an if statement, which is a very common thing to have, you know, to control, uh, you know, if you don't, you know, this is not a little, this thing, I wouldn't turn this into a state machine because you're just checking like one thing um, and then doing different things. But um, yeah, but I wanted to bring up an example of an embedded system diagram. And this I've actually diagrammed out a simple state machine in this. Um, I mean, at, the, at its core, it's the same kind of thing. You've got a main loop and then things happen inside it. Now, outside of my state machine is this, where I'm checking the state of like a GPIO pin to check if it was, um, you know, and no matter what happens, I don't deviate from the, the flow of this loop. You know, I don't, uh, this, so that's why it's not like included in the state machine. It has to happen all the time. But then I've got these different states, uh, one state, two states, three states. And after the execution of each, it continues through the loop. You know, they just, um, each state executes and then continues. And that's the last thing that happens in the loop. Um, so that, that's an example of diagramming out a state machine. But sometimes it's just easier to, um, in this case, it was really borderline because it wasn't efficient to diagram it as a state machine, but it it's a little bit inefficient diagramming it as not a state machine. So, you know, things to think about. Um, you know, and there's only so much, only so much complexity you can do with like this sort of single loop model. So what if we wanted to go with multiple loops and sort of have a simulated multi-threading environment? And that's something that our tosses can allow you to do. Um, so I, I wanted to bring up another example, which is um, our the power of sort of a flow chart for our um, power management system on the NASA robot. And I've got a couple different tasks. I've got a battery task, I've called it, e-stop task. I think, okay, is that all? Okay, it is all. Um, thought there were more, but there's not. And here's almost, you know, almost sort of a, I wouldn't really call it a state machine, but it is a, um, checking a couple different states and doing different things depending on that. Um, and you may wonder you know, why have I why have I separated the two loops? Why have I decided the two loops were necessary? Um, and the I mean the short the short answer is that I needed it honestly became simpler to do that, even though it seems more complicated each loop that I had to make became simpler. And I, you know, I only sort of discovered that after I started diagramming it. But, you know, where there's things like, I mean, what's in it? Let's poke at something. I mean, you know, this is sort of checking the states of an e-stop button and then it's running some kind of timer. That's really simple and that's, that's great. But what if, if I had to sort of run a timer like this or start a timer and have it respond. Well, you know, it really could be conglomerated into a single loop, couldn't it? Well, maybe this was a bad example. Well, but you know, here's an at least one thing this does afford us is we can use a software-defined uh, timer. You can, of course, use hardware timers that will trigger interrupts and things. But in this case, I've decided a software timer could be of use, and it just, you know, sets some kind of flag that will be processed by something else. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's going to be processed somewhere in this loop. This is still a work in progress, but I think it, it gets some point across. Um, Yeah, that's a, you know, that's about, 
the gist of it. Um, I hadn't really, like I said, I've, I'd thought about this lecture for a while and I hadn't come up with exactly what I needed to cover. So um, I guess what I'm saying is that concludes this lecture. Uh, let, so now I would just ask if there are any, uh, any questions or anything that you all would don't understand or, or maybe something that didn't make sense or anything at all. Cool. It sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I remember we we had a we had drawn out a statement machine for the baby ROV at one point mm -hmm. for last year, right? Where we mm -hmm. were um, looking at having it do some yeah some stuff. Yep, state machines, they're nifty. Find yourself using them all, all over the place once you know what they are. I think that was... Mm -hmm. I have a question about RTOS versus interrupts. Yeah. Um, so why would, say like you've got, um, Let's say you've got two or three threads that you're running on a microcontroller. Um, what would be the advantage of using something like an RTOS versus just setting up your own interrupt handler that like round robin style just switches between the different tasks with the state machine? Well, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll you know, full disclosure, it's not my necessarily my area of expertise as to why you would do one or the other, but at least with the RTOS, you get a few different um, benefits, you know, of like different sort of things that the RTOS can do that, um, you know, that are easier to implement, I suppose. I, I really, to me, it really feels like an ease of implementation. It just makes more things easy. Um, not that you couldn't, certainly you could do them the other way. But the RTOS sort of unlocks a lot of other sort of features that are nice. You know, you get ways to, you know, way, safe ways to communicate between threads and you get uh, some, if you have the right RTOS, you get some memory management, um, things like that. In my okay. mind, those are some of the benefits. But I, I think if, if your program is simple enough that the that adding an RTOS takes a significant leap upwards in complexity, I think you should probably go the interrupt route. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure. Well, yeah, well this is this is good. I I hope it was hope hope it was something. So, yeah, that's all I got. Um, we can, I guess we can shut the recording off if there's no other questions. Yeah.